Good evening, everyone. Well, welcome. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, I did can't those two tables, but it's very difficult to see who's. So if I don't see anybody and they're trying to speak, just yell, scream, throw something. Okay, welcome. I'd like to call the Board of SM Taxation meeting to order, and we'll start with the salute to the flag, which is over in the far corner. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So for everybody who started at town meetings this morning at 8 o'clock, or 7.30, or 7.30, I know we have our two Leslie's that did that, and then everybody else has been in meetings all day, so thank you. Uh, who made this schedule? <laughs> blame it on the lane. <laughs> we'll blame it on the lane. Okay, so that brings us to our um, routine applications for this evening, and I would call on Mr. Drake, our clerk. We have... We have five routine applications. The first one is HD3 from the Health Department for $15,456, which is an approval to use grant funds. The second one is ED6 from the Board of Education for $70,000, which is an appropriation to the school lunch fund. The third one is PR1 from Parks and Recreation for $4,900, which is an additional appropriation uh, for the skate park. The fourth one is PR2 from the Department of Parks and Rec, the $4,900, which is an additional appropriation for the golf course roof replacement. And the fifth one is PD5 from the Police Department, $155,326, which is an approval to use grants and an in-kind match uh, for port security. Can I get a second uh, on those? Second. Okay, so our routine applications have been moved and second. Discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? That name is carried 12 0. That brings us to our non routine applications, and I would call on Ms. Tarkington for the first item. Right. Um, so I'm. Mr. I, Chairman, can I suggest that items S. Can I move that items SE 13 and SE 14 be considered together? Can I get a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So opposed? Abstaining. That motion is carried. So, Ms. Tarkington, if you can combine the reports. Okay. Um, so, um, again, I move SC 13 for selectman amount of $36,241.66, an additional appropriation for a settlement, McGuire versus Shapa. Um, again, the law committee, um, Ms. Crummick and I um, met and recommend and approved a settlement of uh, Greg, the <coughs> settlement of Gregory McGuire and Stephen Chiaffa versus Tana Greenwich and Edward Fesco for $36,241.66. And then um, uh, also uh, I move SC14 for selectmen. Um, an amount of $9,479.36. Get it's an additional appropriation for the settlement of travelers insurance in Shopa. Um, again, the law committee met and um, the committee approved um, the uh, settlement of Travelers Home and Marine Insurance Company as subligor of Stephen Shopa versus the town of Greenwich for $9,479.36. <coughs> Um, this is a case of an accident out at Greenwich Point. Um, in the first case, um, the, a town employee was driving a town truck, and um, the other is obviously relates to the damages to um, uh, the automobile. Second. Those items have moved and second. Discussion on those items? Mr. Raymer. Uh, just for me to observe that I will vote against these two items uh, for the reasons that I uh, uh, articulated at the, budget, at the budget committee meeting, which I'm not going to repeat again. Okay, further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. Abstaining? That item is carried 10 to 0. 
Moves us to item five of the agenda. The um, I'm sorry, item three of the agenda, the assessor's report. I'm sorry. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and fellow members of the BET. I'd like to present the assessor's report. Hang on, I got to this. Uh, for February 2017. Uh, first of all, the grand list was signed on January 27th. Um, notices were sent out to all real estate accounts that had changes to them, as well as all personal property accounts. Um, as it stands before the Board of Assessment Appeals, we have an increase in the grand list this year of $359 million over last year's 2015 grand list. Um, the Board of Assessment Appeals um, has been accepting uh, applications, appeals. Uh, the final day is today, the 21st. As of today, they had 211 appeals on real estate and 15 on personal property. Broken down, that's 176 on the residential portion and 35 on commercial. Um, this is not the final count yet, as um, anything was post that was postmarked today is still a valid uh, appeal. Uh, in reference to Past years, the year after a revaluation, in 2006, the Board of Assessment Appeals had 221 appeals. In 2011, they had 259. Uh, so our total of 211 plus whatever we get in the next couple of days is about par for the course. Okay. Um, as to our litigation so far, our 2012 appeal that's still outstanding, unfortunately the trial was continued. We will not be... Um, we will not be litigating that for another couple of months. Other than that, uh, we have a couple of pending settlements, but they are not, they're not completed as of yet. Okay. Anybody have any questions for me? Yes. I, oh, well, sorry. I was just going to suggest that you, um, with, there's an additional attachment on here um, about um, with Greenwich Hospital and all of its um, <coughs> subsidiaries. Um, because of the recent discussion about the state um, potentially or the town being able to tax Greenwich Hospital. Um, we've seen certain numbers, um, but we did ask you to put together some information. Mm -hmm. it, it, I thought it was rather interesting, and I thought all the BEP members would be interested in this information. Do you want to just spend sure. one minute on your paragraph? Sure. Um, so what have, what under the normal course in Connecticut, uh, your hospital property is reimbursed by the state but not dollar for dollar. It's usually up to 77%, depending upon what the state has for funding. Um, back in 2011, my predecessor, Mr. Courtney, determined certain properties that are to be exempt or be part of this pilot program and certain properties that he's deemed to be taxable. Um, as it stands, you can see that there are a number of properties that are owned by Greenwich Hospital, but they are not actually the hospital itself. Um, to date, as far as I, the state has accepted reimbursement of un, under the, uh, for the, the uh, parcels that are not actually the hospital. However, with the pending, litigate, uh, pending uh, uh, legislation out there, uh, I'm not quite sure where the, the uh, town of Greenwich will, will stand on that. My concern is that in addition to not only the real estate, but there is a number of personal property accounts that also could be considered taxable. And I think that's something that the town of Greenwich should go back in and reinvest and investigate. Uh, let me see if this is on. Um, Lauren, I found the re <coughs> report in that regard very interesting, and I was surprised to see so many of the Northeast medical properties mm -hmm. on that list. It wouldn't have been what I would have expected. And do you have a sense from other cities and communities how they treat these extensions? I would have thought the, you know, it would have been the core hospital facility and wouldn't have included sort of for-profit, you know, doctors' practices. It's not the... The for-profit doctors are not, they'll contest that they're not really for-profit in the sense that they are paid a specific salary, and I think that was how this was determined. I don't know exactly how this is 
like I said, this was done before my tenure here. Um, my understanding from other municipalities is that if, if the state gave them the pilot, they would put as much on that pilot as they possibly can and, and left it there. Um, and I think the state probably did that um, not only here in Greenwich, but in New Haven and where there's a number of other, um, you know, a fair amount of property owned and operated by the Greenwich or Yale New Haven Hospital. Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit about the residential exempt, the exempt residential property? I was surprised also to see how many properties were residential and whether that's the practice throughout the state for various not-for-profit hospital entities, um, whether there's any distinction between the different residences, and also, uh, it's just as an aside, I was curious whether the, uh, if it is all exempt, is that uh, foregone tax deemed to be imputed income to the resident or the tenant, and are they taxed on that? That's something I, I don't know the answer to as to whether or not. I would assume that if you are given a benefit, free housing, whatever that is, considered a, um, a benefit, an income. I think the IRS requires you to report it as such. I don't know exactly what the Greenwich Hospital does. In, in all honesty, I don't know what you all did back in 2010. I don't know. I, I would have thought... Um, that housing would have been a taxable entity. That's my, that i be quite frank about that. Um, I'm not quite sure unless there was an argument, and I'm, I have a letter from our prior assessor that said basically the residential structures, as long as they were being utilized for employee transitional housing, that they, they considered them exempt. Um, so, so Lauren, is this something that we should be looking at yes. in terms of whether we need to change the status mm -hmm. and um, also um, obviously to make sure it's concrete you I mean I would suggest that you be benchmarking with other communities that have major hospitals Stanford or you know you know what from your own community um, they might be but I think this is definitely an area that we need to continue to look at and quite honestly you know, as we look at some of our other issues in terms of whether we have sufficient um, housing under whatever it's 30G or whatever it is, um, if for some reason they're not paying taxes, it seems to me we ought to be getting credit for these particular housing units um, and they should be properly, um, whatever legally needs to be done, deeded or whatever, you know, um, accordingly. Mm -hmm. at, for the 40-year period, whatever, whatever that particular code is. Uh, there were a couple of questions asked of me in caucus that I thought I should ask you to speak to. I thought that, that they should hear from you about it. Uh, one of them was um, on the sketch verification project, mm -hmm. uh, the nearly 3,000 parcels that had major errors, the 350 or so that had minor errors, and the 320 with questionable errors. You had responded to it once before, but I'm going to ask you to respond to it again so people hear you um, describing what makes an item a major error, what minor, and what's the nature of the properties that have questionable errors, that category that was particularly interesting. Okay, so um, major errors are errors w w upon the major, on the main structure of over 100, uh, of 100 square feet of living area. They're not outbuildings, they're not, they're nothing, that have something to do with the main dwelling on the property. Um, minor, er uh, minor errors are less than, less than that. Um, and the 320 with questionable errors, unfortunately, when you fly, do a flyover, you may or may not see the entire extent of the building based upon coverage by trees, what have you. So there are certain that they couldn't say yes or no as to whether it was an error or not, um, but that's something that we need to look at. And potentially these might be dwellings that are completely different than what's shown on your field card. Yes. And the other area that I thought was interesting that I had questions about is uh, they, I was asked questions about the um, uh, Senior Citizens Tax Relief Program. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I wondered if you'd speak to the credit versus the deferral and allow me to say most politely to you that at least one member thought 
that it wasn't that your flyer here didn't describe uh, adequately the choice that one has between credit and deferral and wondered if perhaps you wanted to do some revision of the flyer to make that a little clearer. But anyway, would you tell the body how the credit and deferrals work? Well, yes. Um, the credit is an automatic credit given to a taxpayer or property owner without any lien placed on the property. The deferral has a lien. You have either or here. And what has happened over the course of time here in, in Greenwich since you've implemented this program is that the benefit is about the same whether you you file under the um, the credit versus the deferral. So people are taking the credit option because that has no lien, that has no uh, lien against their property. So that's ultimately why I think, and, they're, and, the, and the benefit's about the same. Um, so that's why I have a feeling you're getting more people under the credit program than you're getting under the deferral. Are you getting any deferral? No, we have zero. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. No. And, and, and quite <laughs> frankly, the deferral program, was, I was on this committee and then on the amended committee, where the deferral program was added at a later date. Um, I think and so. And mm -hmm. it really, um, yeah, it didn't really um, have the impact ever um, for maybe some of the reasons you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The people reading the the uh, people in my caucus reading this said actually it doesn't say anywhere here about how you're picking you have uh, yes I see that it has B. to be either or yeah, that needs uh, to be in here and, yes and, and, and that yeah. could have been uh, mm -hmm. could have been expressed uh, thank you I have nothing else oh, I do have one other Lauren I'll make my usual comment I go sure. away for a couple of weeks yeah. and I say the, I did the nothing litigation mode doesn't change <laughs> well I was waiting for you to return. <laughs> <laughs> I Can't tried. I tried. I really did. I tried my darndest. Unfortunately, uh, we had a few couple of snow days, and we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we didn't. Yeah. Uh, I had one other follow-up sure. on that residential. So you, you have identified 439 <coughs> exempt residential properties. What percentage is, are the hospital properties of that 439, and what comprise? I mean, maybe we could get a listing of all the other exempt prop residential as well. It's. Other resident, uh, I'm right. sorry. Is it, is it only hospital property, residential property that's exempt on your, um, one of your pages? Oh, right. You have mm -hmm. uh, the 2016 count at 439. The other, resi uh, the other residential exempt properties would be, consists of uh, parishes for churches, uh, school properties of housing. Um, there's a, any, any tax exempt enti entity, a religious charitable under the statutes, under our state statutes, 12-81. So this rather large uh, development of housing, for example, at Country Day, across the street from Country Day, that I think Country Day owns, uh, is that taxed? That's tax exempt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Editorial comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you get it, Ken? Okay. <laughs> I didn't see you write anything. Further discussion of the assessor report? I, I'll entertain a motion. So I, I move that the assessor's report be approved. And I second that. And, and Discussion? And thank you, Laura. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Thank, thank you. you. That brings us to item number four, the controller's report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, BET members. You all have a copy of the uh, controller's report. Uh, I will answer any questions in the report or related to the report at this time. Um, I, I, I'd like to uh, I'd like to bring two things to this. I uh, I'm fortunate enough now to serve on the audit committee with Mr. Blankley, Ms. Overlander, and Mr. Norton, and I've come to learn a few things. One of the discussion points today in the budget deliberations was a program that risk manager started for the vehicles, and there was some conversations there, and I just showed it in your report to Mr. Lash, but. Our risk manager, if you go to page two and read that very top sentence, since fiscal 2003, just in FEMA alone, has recovered $3.9 million for the town. That's really good. The really bad part is our current risk manager is retiring. Yeah. The first paragraph. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say that members of the audit committee, within the boundaries of the law, tried to convince him to stay, not retire, and Ron Lally will be missed. And he has been in several jobs for the town, and I just, I want to say, I heard all about it, but it, just to watch him in the last year or so, it's just amazing. And, and I'm glad you put all that in your report. That's pretty good. Here, here, I agree with you. 
Well, Mike, I'd just like to comment on, on the last paragraph uh, before internal audit. And we discussed today about reinstating those funds to the very to the three departments that, that, are, that applies. And seeing them in a public meeting uh, tonight, I, I think that, that should be highlighted. Because it's a very effective program. It's a best <coughs> best business practices. And uh, the town has been very beneficial by the implementation last year with uh, Parks and Recreation. Anything else? I'll entertain a motion that they be so moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? That is carried. Item number five. Move to accept I have, a, I have a motion to accept the treasurer's report for. Second. Seconded by Ms. Tarkington. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstaining? That item is carried. Uh, Item number six, BET Standing Committee reports. I know Mr. Norton has an item later on. Nothing there. Investment law. Um, real quick, on tomorrow's law committee, Ms. Tarkington, it's 1.30? It's 1.30. Okay, just checking because I think that might have been. Anything else under those? Nothing. Special project teams. Okay, new business. First item, item number one under new business, Mr. Norton. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, I chair the audit committee, and one of the primary responsibilities of the audit committee is overseeing the annual audit. And I think for everybody, make sure that everybody understands that the, um, our external audit for doing the annual audit actually reports to the audit committee, and it's done in effect for the audit committee. But going forward, this is becoming, I think, far more important, and it's becoming far more important because of the outstanding levels of debt that the town has. At the current time, we have debt that equals approximately an amount to 50% of our operating expenses. And that's a substantial uh, sum of money. And I think it's very, very important and crucial uh, that the, the auditor's annual report and uh, the report that gives to, they give to us because it's, it's used by the investors. And I can speak personally as an institutional investor. We always refer to the, the audit of, of an entity when we're taking positions uh, in their um, securities that are being offered, whether they're, they're debt or equity. So as a result of that, last Tuesday, the audit committee met, and we interviewed the, the two candidates who sought to uh, do the five-year re renew extension of our annual audit. The approach that we took uh, to discuss with them was quite extensive, and we considered both tangible as well as intangible items uh, for their proposed service. And at the end of the day, uh, we came to a unanimous conclusion to recommend RSM McLeodry. Oh, it used to be, it's, I guess it's RSM uh, LL, LLP. It used to be uh, McLeodry and Pullen. And I think that the reason at which I personally, and I think the committee was most comfortable, is that both the continuation with them and the size as now the, the fifth largest uh, auditor in the United States. And I think that becomes very important when, it, when investors consider the debt of, of an entity and they want to know who has done the, who provides the, the annual audit, the reviews that they give, because I can tell you personally that the investors do consider that. As I said, our, re, our review was extensive, our vote was four to nothing, and I think that we made the right choice. So subsequent to that, I have the uh, following amendment uh, resolution to make resolved that the Board of Estimate Taxation in accordance with provisions of the Connecticut General Statute and upon the advice of its audit committee hereby appoints RSM US LLP as the independent public accountants to conduct the annual audit of the Town of Greenwich for the next two fiscal years beginning July 1st, 2017 and 2000, July 1st, 2018 with the option of an additional three one-year terms given the approval of both parties. The proposal that they made to us, uh, both they and uh, Bloom Shapiro, who were the other candidates, indicated to us what the cost for the five years will be of the, of the doing the, the annual audit and somewhere north of $700,000 over the five year period. But on behalf of the committee, I so move, Mr. Chairman. So that, uh, that resolution has been moved on behalf of the audit committee discussion? Ms. Weisler? Yes. Um, so were the um, fees comparable for both? Yes. Yes. Okay. At the end of the day, they were almost the same. And does it step up over time? You yes, said 700000 So, and how much does it step up per year? 
It's approximately. like about 3%, I think. Is it. Yeah. You have a schedule? Okay, thanks. As is, is, uh, uh, Mr. Norton said, they're very close. Um, the uh, first year, uh, starting July 1st, is 124,000. Then it goes 128.5, 133.5, 138, 142.5. Now, keep in mind that in the case of the budget, we put 140,000 in for next year. They, they will, on occasion, do certain projects on the side. Nathaniel Witherall, they certified the cost for project renew for a few thousand dollars. And um, the Mary Lee's gone and uh, Fingers gone. Leslie was on the committee um, uh, with Mark Johnson. They did work uh, for the Housing Authority um, review of their re financial records. So this is the contract that, that was, was bid on, but they, they will do additional work at the request of the BET. Before we vote, I'd like to make one other point. We were concerned with RSM, who has been on the auditor for, I believe, uh, 15 of the last 20 years. And they have will have a rotational partner. They're a, a partner serving the town of Greenwich it actually come, will come out of the New York City office. Uh, uh, Jennifer Katz, who lives in northern New Jersey. Uh, one of the concerns that I had personally, I think other members of the co committee had, is the partner who would handle the Bloom Shapiro was actually a resident of uh, Western Ro Rhode Island. And I was concerned about the distance traveling and to reach us. I mean, it, it's one thing to, to go 50 miles to, to work, but it's another thing to travel 130 miles to work. But, uh, I think that we were very satisfied with the presentation that RSM uh, made to us. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to report that uh, we just I was able to make this resolution going forward. Mr. Raymer, I had you next. Uh, yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Norton. Um, uh, I, I, I place a value on there being some rotation from uh, periodically to use one outside order and then after a few years to use another. And it had seemed to me, uh, Mr. Norton, that um, that has been the policy of the <coughs> audit committee uh, under your leadership. Um, I wonder if you'd comment on that and, and comment particularly as to whether or not you'd be anticipating at the end of this potentially five-year contract we might be rotating back at that point to Coach Shapiro. I would answer to, that I think it, it's important the service that the external audit provides, who the partner in charge is, the rotation I'm referring to is not so much to firms, it's the partner in charge within the firm doing the auditor. It's an industry standard that after a period of time, normally no more than five years, there is a partner rotation within the firm. So if one of the so-called final four is still is auditing your entity, there will be a rotation of partner within the firm. The rotation of firms, um, I, I think, has to be a function of, of services and, and credibility. And it, it seems to me that a, a firm that the size of McGladry versus a, a much smaller firm will give the investing public, and we have to be concerned about that because of the 200 plus million dollars of outstanding debt we have, and I don't think any of us on this board can see the, the amount of outstanding debt shrinking very much in, in the next five years, and maybe ba based upon our CIP process uh, with a 15 year uh, capital plan in action that uh, the, the amount of debt that we have, both the size as well as the proportion to our total expenditures is, is going to be very much different. So I, I think it's very important that whoever is auditing us has you know, credibility and a, and a level of confidence within the investing community. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I have the highest regard for the leadership that ART has given us on the audit committee, uh, and, and none of uh, what's happening here makes uh, any change in my confidence in him. Nevertheless, speaking perhaps just for myself, while I have no objection to this contract and recognize that it may be for his term as for, for as much as five years, uh, I personally would be recommending to this body that at the end of this term, five years if it is, uh, that we be seriously considering uh, changing and just that I think it is good practice to bring uh, a change of outside auditors uh, into the audit process even though you're, you're enjoying a change, uh, a rotation, that was your expression, of partners. Uh, without my disparaging that, I think there's a benefit to a change of firms as well. Uh, and I just make that in hopes that somebody five years from today may actually remember it was said. Because I'll be long gone. Mr. Blankley. I, I certainly anticipate being here in five years' time, so I'll, I'll bear Mr. Raymer's remarks uh, 
in mind uh, at that time. L let me just say, I believe I'm the only member of this board who has been uh, an outside auditor. I believe also I, I'm the only a member of this board who was a senior executive of firm, um, a corporation, public company, uh, in fact more than one that uh, had outside auditors. Firm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, where, where this matter of rotation uh, was considered. It, it's a very important aspect of um, modern uh, financial management and uh, we took that very seriously in our uh, committee. Uh, I was uh, satisfied very much uh, listening to the report of uh, RSM uh, and was very happy that uh, this point of rotation is being covered by the rotation of, of partners. So uh, Mr. Raymond makes a good point, but I, I think we, we covered it and were satisfied in our committee. I have nothing further. Further discussion? Okay, so on the resolution to hire the auditor for the next um, it's a five-year contract with two years certain and three one-year options at the recommendation of the audit committee. <coughs> All those in favor? Uh, uh, you need a second, I do believe. Uh, it's from a committee. Oh, it's a committee report. Oh, it's a committee report. Yeah. Mm. So, oh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? That item is carried 12-0. Item number two under new business. I'll call on Ms. Weisler. Uh, this is the issue pertaining to MNC compensation for fiscal 18. Uh, the BET meeting package includes the HR committee report on MNC compensation for fiscal 18. This report summarized the data that the committee reviewed and its votes. For the past three years, MNC compensation has been based on a pay for performance. For fiscal 2018, the HR committee voted to continue to include pay for performance in the MNC plan, uh, the final details of which will, we will work with the HR director um, after the percentage has been agreed upon. The HR committee took two votes on recommendations to the BET on the percent increase in the MNC compensation pool for 2018. The vote on a 2% increase was 2-2 and the vote on a 2.5% increase was 2-2. And if it's the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion to increase the MNC compensation pool by 2% for fiscal 2018. Do I have a second on that? Yes. Mr. Drake, discussion on the motion? If I could just weigh in with a few comments. Sure, discussion sure. on the motion. Um, before I briefly explain the rationale for this motion, I'd like to say that I very much appreciate the hard work and dedication of our MNC employees. However, in the context of the state's deteriorating financial condition and the pressure that that places on the town's finances, I believe that an increase of 2% is fair. An increase of 2% is consistent with the budget guidelines and is in fact in excess of the proposed 1.4% increase in the town budget. Moreover, Town of Greenwich MNC employees continue to be paid at a significant premium to their peers, one that should be large enough to motivate our MNC employees to continue to do their good work that they've done on reducing costs and improving efficiency. And we've also heard from the HR director that our MNC salaries are competitive in both attracting and retaining employees. The further discussion? Ms. Oberlander? Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to make a motion to amend Ms. Weisler's motion to 2.5 percent. Okay, I have, a, I have a motion to amend the Weisler motion to change the percentage on the pool of money from 2 percent to 2.5. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Crummick. Discussion on the, discussion on the motion to amend. Mr. Chairman. As noted in the HR committee report, the committee considered the statistics for similarly situated employees as well as the actual increases awarded last year for this employee group. This data, as more specifically included in the report, reflects general wage and step increases for union employees for 2016, ranging from 2.6 to 3.0 percent, and salary increases for a broad range of national, municipal, and corporate entities projected at 2.9 percent for 2017. In addition, the weighted average increase for last year for this group of employees, the MNC, was 2.2% and less than the full pool of available funds. 
Um, I agree with Ms. Weisler, I think we all do, that we're fortunate to have hardworking and dedicated employees in all of our categories. And since we are relying on the MNC employees to lead our cost-saving initiatives, I, we make the recommendation that we compensate the pool at 2.5%, understanding that CPI for the last year has been at 1.6, and it leaves some room to provide the performance-based compensation. Further discussion on a motion to amend? Mr. Lash? So I would recommend against that. Um, it's true that the unionized employees in town have been achieving through the legal process in the state of Connecticut um, increases that exceed the rate of inflation and the general increase in wages in the area. Uh, the consequence of that is, as we see in the budget that the first selectman put forward this year, uh, the town seeks ways to economize on the costs of operations, and sometimes that refle is reflected in reduction in headcount. Uh, the guideline for the budget for this year was a 2% increase overall. And the first selectman's budget came in somewhat below that. Uh, the draft that we're working on now is somewhat below that. Um, and I think that we're sending the right message, if there's a message to be sent in the labor negotiations, that when we're saying we want to keep the overall cost increases in the town to 2% or less, that we're serious about it. Uh, this isn't that we don't have a high regard for our unionized employees or for our MNC employees. We do. Uh, by and large, they all do a very good job. Uh, but there are consequences, as the auto industry learned, from wage increases that couldn't be justified over time by the ability to, in their case, deliver the product and get people to buy at it higher and higher prices. The equivalent of that in, the, in government is the willingness of taxpayers to pay higher and higher taxes. And the finance board is challenged to keep the costs of, in this case, Greenwich government down. So uh, I, think, I think this is, I think, giving the MNC employees a larger increase because the unionized employees have had some success is not communicating what we want to communicate and frankly would eventually lead to fewer MNC employees because we have to find ways to manage the budget and the employees account for over 70 percent of the total budget. So I would urge you to reject this particular proposal. So, further discussion on the amended motion? Okay, all those in favor of the, the motion is the same. The amended motion calls for a 2.5% pool. So all those in favor of the motion as amended? One, two, three, four, five, six. All those against, opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me just write that down. That vote is 6-6. Six, six. That hasn't carried. That brings us back to the original motion, which is the same motion at the 2% level. Discussion on the back on the original motion. Mr. Drake? I, I'd say that the, that the key thing to think about when saying these salaries is that no one group should bear an unnecessary burden nor benefit out of proportion to others. Every group stands on its own. And, and uh, this, this is an excellent group of employees, and our task is to set salaries that are competitive and market-based, and I believe these are, and a 2% increase fulfills that requirement. So I'll be voting for the 2% increase. I think the, the committee did a lot of thorough work and heard a lot of data from a lot of people to come to that conclusion. Mr. Raymer? Uh, I would have preferred the 2.5% since that failed, I will be voting in favor of the 2% um, as an indication of my support for the MNC employees as well. 
No further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, uh, I'm going to call it the Ms. Weissler motion, just so we're clear. All those in favor of that motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Well, that sorry. item has carried, 12-0-0. That brings us to item three on the agenda for new business. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Raymer. Uh, I would make a motion uh, to postpone this item. The uh, uh, Budget Committee, in its deliberations during Consolidation Day today, has uh, set funding uh, as being one of the subjects to be discussed on Thursday afternoon. I'm also aware from attending the HR Committee that the HR Committee will be meeting with at least one of the elected officials uh, on the uh, 9th of March at which I think certain pivotal issues will be resolved as well. In light of those items, I would ask uh, that you kindly entertain my motion to postpone this item. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, normally I have discussion on it. Let me just, um, so we understand, when I put, just for clarification, I put this item on because, as you know, the, the last two items had gone through a lot of conversation in the HR committee for months. Uh, I was pleased to hear the conversations about all of these departments and budget committee and you're taking it up Thursday. So I would support that motion because I'm glad of the progress that was made today. So if there's no other further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? That motion has carried. Brings us to old business. I have none that I know of. Um, I'm going to get dinner. Approval of BET minutes for January 10th. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Everybody was here. No, 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 no. Time out oh, one second. Mr. Norton, when weren't you here? I was here for, the, for that meeting. Oh, you were here for that no, meeting. No, I see I'm not listed as the vice chair. But okay. Oh, no, they were. <laughs> okay, so that's 12 0 That's what it's saying right here. Okay. Next, uh, can I get a motion for January 18th minutes? I yes. move the minutes of January 18th. I second. Cool. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? I abstain. Mr. Wright, Mr. Norton abstained. 11-01. Uh, Mr. Drake, do you have anything? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Norton? No, Mr. Chairman. I didn't see any email with a picture of some wild cocktail while you were away, while we were up here. How'd you miss it? <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, so far, the budget process has been incredible. I just really want to go on record. I can't. I haven't seen it this involved. I think we've had, except for one or two, almost 100% participation by everyone. Um, you know, I really want to thank you. The work is beginning. I am going to begin a schedule for committees and district for our April and our May meetings, RTM. So start looking at the RTM calendar. Uh, if there's nights that you know you can't make, please just shoot me an email. Uh, I am trying to get together with Mr. Turner <laughs> and try to do uh, a little get together in the department with finance, but that Mr. Lash and Ms. Weisler and the law committee are just every day, all day. And <laughs> so we will get to that. And Good, I, thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. But other than that, that's that's all I have for this evening. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I move we adjourn. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone.